Welcome back. Um, okay, let's let's continue from where we started with. And now we have a, a set of axioms for for what is a CFT to some extent, and we would like to implement these axioms now to actually do some work. Um, so in practice. We need to figure out how to implement this associativity. In practice, this is done by, by projecting onto, a, onto another operator. Associativity is an equality between two infinite sums of operators, but because this, the two-point functions are orthogonal, you can, always, you can always project it. You can always compute a four-point function with a fourth operator and, and test the associativity of the first triplet. So I can, I can now replace the requirement of associativity of arbitrary triplet of operators with the, you know, with the statement that this, this, the same thing holds after, after computing the four-point function with an arbitrary fourth operator. So in, uh, in, in, the, in the rest of these lectures, I'm going to focus on a specific four-point function, namely the four-point function of four identical scalars. So phi is a scalar primary operator. Now we can use conformal symmetry to write this four-point function as follows. So actually, sorry, I don't, I don't like what I wrote. I'm going to call them x1 up to x4. Sorry about that. By conformal symmetry, we can use this four point, you can, we can write this four point function as this. There is some prefactor which takes care of the scaling of the operators. And then there is a function which depends on two variables, z and z bar, where the z and z bar are defined as follows. So first of all, I'm going to define two cross ratios, which are just uh, some conformally invariant ratios of the distances. So xij means x1, sorry, xi minus xj. And v is x14 So you can convince yourself that these are the only two, well, these are the only two continuous invariants of the four points, uh, the conformal group. Uh, and then z and z bar are defined as follows. Z, well, u is just z, z bar, and v, and v is this. So to understand this, it's, it's much better to draw a picture. I can always make a conformal transform, I can make a conformal transformation which maps the point x1 to zero. So sorry, I, I'm going to, I can map the four points to a, to a given two-dimensional plane of the d-dimensional space. Let me call this plane x, it's going to be spent by x1 and xd. Maybe this is too small. Yeah. And in this plane, I'm going to map my four operators into, into these locations. This is 0, 1, and x4 is going to be at infinity. And then x2 is, is unconstrained, can be in principle anywhere. Then u is just u is just this distance, is the distance between, uh, u is the distance between x1 and x2, and v is the distance between x2 and x3. So I can think of z as being just the, the complex coordinate param sorry, x1, xd, parameterizing this two-dimensional plane, and z bar is the complex conjugate. So in the, in the Euclidean signature, in particular, the z, the z parameter is a complex conjugate of z bar. So z, z, yes, and just to make this clear, z bar is just a, just a name. The, the bar doesn't mean complex conjugation. But, but when I study Euclidean correlators, the, the variable z bar is, the, is always the complex conjugate of, of, z, of z. This is not going to be true in general, but it's true in Euclidean signature. Now I can use the OP expansion to expand the four-point function. So I'm just going to talk about the function zz bar. Well, 
<coughs> so what, what, what happens when I, when I use the OPE? I, I expand in the OPE these two operators. So I'm, I'm going to introduce some, some primer operator O. Okay, let, let me write this on a separate board. The OPE without without writing all the distance factors is just going to be a sum over primary operators which can appear in the OPE of phi and phi mm -hmm. where it's, it's not very hard to see that the only the only representations which can appear in this op in the OPE of two scalars are are symmetric traceless tensors of SOD I think uh, it's going to be a very, very trivial consequence of, of what Petter will tell you in his lectures. I don't want to spend too much time on that. But basically, it's because you, you can only contract, uh, I mean, in the, in the position dependence, you can only contract uh, the, indis, the, in the representation indices of O with, with factors of X. So the only way, the only operator that can be there is a symmetric traceless guy. So when we perform this OP in this four-point function, we are going to find an infinite sum over these primary operators, of C phi phi O, and then we need to compute the three-point function of O with phi and phi, so we get another factor of C, and then, then, some, then some object, which is, completely, which is completely fixed by conformal invariance. So, so O is going to be a symmetric laser tensor of spin j. j is just the number of indices of the, of the, of the tensor. So this, this object is, is fixed by conformal invariance. And it's called a conformal block. And it is known in essentially closed form in, uh, in, 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 any, in any situation now, I think. Over the last couple of years, there has been a lot of progress in understanding general conformal blocks. I'm not going to write down the explicit form, I think. But uh, yeah, in, in, in even dimensions, the, they can be written using some hypergeometric functions. In, uh, in odd or continuous dimensions, uh, there is no very closed formula, but you can always write them as some, as some infinite sums over, over known special functions. So we, we have a very good control over, over what the conformal blocks are. So now this, this, this expansion arose from expanding on using the, the OP between x1 and x2 but we can also use the OP between X2 and X3, which is going to give us an alternative expansion. Where the first one is called the S channel. The second one is called the T channel. Now, I, because of the prefactor in front, I need to be a bit careful with the prefactor here. And it's, it looks essentially the same, except except uh, z goes to 1 minus z. And hence, because z bar is the complex conjugate of z, z bar goes to 1 minus z bar. And the, the equality of these two expansions is what is known as the, as the conformal bootstrap equation. Well, let me just write it in, in full glory. We have zz bar minus delta phi, sum over these operators. It, 
is equal to the same thing with z exchange with 1 minus z and z bar exchange with 1 minus z bar. Okay, so, and this is, this is the simplest example of a, of a conformal bootstrap equation or, or a crossing equation. And it, it, it really is a, is a magical, magical equation with many remarkable properties and many strong and unexpected consequences. By the way, until, until when do I have? One, one forty. Okay, well, that's that's a lot of time. Thanks. Great. Okay. Uh, question. So uh, technically, until now, you haven't used the fact that um, the theory is unitary, right? Other than maybe by constraining which deltas and gates can appear in that sum. Mm -hmm. Well, the the other way that unitarity enters is is in is in uh, fixing the c's to be real. So, in particular, the op, in particular, the coefficients of this expansion are are positive, thanks, thanks very much. I, I should have said it even without you asking me that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that, I guess that, that goes into the, into the sub-comment sub that, that he made that it restricts a set of deltas so that can appear. All right. But, but of course, if, if, if the dilatation operator is Hermitian, then we can use the theorem that the, that there are, the Jordan blocks are always trivial. You can, it cannot occur. Good. Um, so just to, just to illustrate very simply some constraining power of this equation very initially, let me show that these sums must actually include infinitely many operators. So we... Yeah, it's, it's not very hard to see that the phi phi OPE contains the identity operator. That's just because the two-point function is non-vanishing. So, yeah. We can call it a little theorem. There are infinitely many O's in the phi phi OPE. Assuming there is identity in the OPE. And the, the way to see this is that you, you look at the two sides, well, uh, and you take the limit where z goes to 1. And correspondingly, well, z bar also goes to 1, because there are complex conjugates. Now, on the right hand, on the right -hand side, you can, you can see that the, the sum is, is dominated by identity. So the right-hand side goes like 1 minus z to the minus 2 delta phi. So this, this actually this blows up as z goes to 1. Whereas on the left-hand side, the, the sum is not dominated by any individual block, but we need to look at the z, z bar going to 1 behavior of each conformal block. So when z goes to 1, This goes like, well, this is of order of a logarithm. So in particular, no individual block in the S channel can reproduce the, the T channel singularity coming from the identity. So the only way we can get this enhanced singularity is to, is to have an infinite number of, is to have an infinite number of summons on the, on the left-hand side. And uh, I think, I think uh, the, the first Davis lecture is going to explain a, 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 a far-reaching refinement of this claim, which is the, the existence of, of double twist operators. Is that, is that right? Yeah, yeah. so that's going to be a, 
far-reaching refinement of this of this little theorem. Uh, okay. Yeah, per, ju just just in case you, you don't know, I, I, th there is one thing which I used here about conformal blocks. Is, the, is there well? Is there small small easy bar behavior? So when in the in the Euclidean signature. When I, when I write z as, as r times e to the i phi, then the, the conformal block as r goes to 0 behaves like r to the delta. So it, it, is, yeah, it, is, it, is, beca it is because of this that the, the, that the t channel sum is dominated by identity. Well, you, yeah, yes, it is. It is true. I mean, the, the, the power law is true. You can you can normalize your blocks in any in any way you want. So there, there could be some prefactor. Usually, the the prefactor is chosen such that the, it's not one in there. I think. Well, it, it also it might also depend on the spin. But uh, sorry, I guess this, this this is not quite correct because I need to decorate it by by some dependence on the angle. There's some Gegenbauer polynomial. Dependence on the angle, but but I I, I only I only wanted to, to mention the the, large, the small r behavior. Yeah, I, you're going to more learn more about uh, this probably in Peter's Peter's lectures. So now, now I would like to say a few words about when when does the crossing equation hold? So we have these uh, we have these points. This is x1, x3, x2, and x4 is somewhere at infinity. And uh, well, the the S-channel expansion holds precisely when I can when I can find a Hilbert space on a sphere to to to, to expand the product of these two operators x1 and x2. So it, it holds precisely when when I can find a sphere that that surrounds the operators x1 and x2 such that x3 and x4 do not lie in the sphere. And this, I mean, the, 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 only, the only points in the Euclidean plane when, where this is not allowed are the ones on the, on the real axis between, x, between x, x3 and x4. So it holds everywhere except for z being in the interval from one to infinity, right? Uh, I can be I can be arbitrarily close. I can I can take x two arbitrarily close to this axis between x four x x three and x four, and there will always be some very very large sphere that that contains x one and x two and does not contain x three and x four. But I can I cannot do it when I can certainly not do it when x two is here. I can certainly do it when x two is here. There's no problem, but not not when x two is here. And uh, sorry, where, where is the big guy? Is it? Furthermore, more you can show that in an arbitrary bounded region of this this convergence region, the convergence is exponentially fast. This is a is a result of uh, well, you, you, can, you can you can look it up in a paper of Papa Dopulu, Richkov et al. That in every bounded subregion of this region. Convergence is Exponentially fast. So what, what I mean by, by bounded bounded subregion is that any, well, anything which which is a finite distance away from this axis and also from infinity, which means that eventually it has to shrink somewhere like like that. The, the region cannot go all the way to infinity because infinity is a, is really a part of this of line. Mm -hmm. 
Now, th that was that was for for the S-channel expansion, and now the T-channel expansion is just the it's just a symmetric version of that when I need to map z to 1 minus z. So t channel converges. Can somebody tell me what, when, it, when it converges? Just. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's probably, it's probably too, too, too trivial, so you're embarrassed to answer. <laughs> yeah, so converges outside minus infinity to, to 0, which is just the map of the original of the, the original integral to but under under crossing so at the end of the day the the crossing equation makes sense where both s and t channel converges so the crossing equation in the z plane makes sense whenever we are away from either this this uh, semi line or this semi line and the convergence is exponentially fast in every bounded, bounded region, I mean, region which is bounded away from the, from the axis. So in every such a region, you're going to have an exponentially fast convergence. So this, this was a discussion, discussion of the regime where the OP converges into the Euclidean signature, but uh, in the in last couple of years, we have seen a, a lot of progress in, uh, in the bootstrap, which, which has resulted from studying Lorentzian correlators. So I would like to, I would like to spend some time now to discuss uh, the convergence and other, other properties of the, of the crossing equation in Lorentzian or in, in, a, general, in a general signature. So <clears throat> the, the, the best way to get Lorentzian correlators out of the Euclidean correlators is just to, well, just to, just to big rotate. So we are, we are going to relabel x. Uh, we're going to define x0 to be, uh, to be related to xd in this way. And then Lorentzian, Lorentzian correlators are just matrix elements in the vacuum of operators which are inserted at, at uh, real values of x0. Oh, maybe I can write it like that. where oh, sorry this is wrong it should be zero mm -hmm. where I, I, I get the, the local operator at the Lorentzian time by time evolving as follows. Very good. And uh, uh, let's see. So we need we need e to the minus that this is like this is like time evolution in Euclidean signature. This must become minus i x zero. So that means that x d should be i times x zero. So I think you agree with this and now Ah, sorry. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, thanks. Thanks. I, I thought I thought I had to do the inverse transformation. Yeah. Oh, sorry about that. Yeah. Now it's. Are you happy now? Thanks. Yeah. Good. And well, you you can also compute these matrix elements by path integral in some cases, specifically in the case when uh, when all the operators are time ordered in Minkowski signature. You can just get them by 
by, ro by rotating the whole configuration from the Euclidean one. But I, I, think, I think David is going to say, say more about this, this, this business of the i epsilon prescription and the rotation in, in his lectures probably. But, but some, an important thing is that these correlates actually also make sense when the operators are outside of time order. So unlike, unlike the Euclidean ones, which had to be ordered properly for the, for, for the operators inside to be, to be bound, for the evolution operators to be bounded, there, there is no problem here. And it's, it's, it's not very clear, at least to me, if, if there is some path integral prescription for the out, out of time ordered correlators, but, but, but certainly there is a path integral description of the, of the time ordered ones. But the, 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 I mean the, the way that you should really, uh, one useful way of thinking about all these correlators is that uh, the, you, you can always go back to the Euclidean signature where the correlators are, are well behaved. They all have singularities at coincident points in, in Euclidean space. And then you, you get on the Lorentzian ones by un, un, analytically continuing. And the, 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 sp the specific ordering of the Lorentzian, I mean, if, if you want to get the Lorentzian correlator with a specific ordering, it just corresponds to a particular path of the analytic continuation. But, but again, you're, you're going to hear more about this in, in Davis lectures, I, I think. So, in, I mean, in some sense, the, the Euclidean, Euclidean correlators are, are more fundamental ones, and the Lorentzian ones are somehow derived property by using the analytic continuation. In, in fact, there is, a, there is a theorem, which is called the Osterwalder Oster Oster Schrader theorem. Osterwalder Schrader reconstruction theorem. Which, which basically says that if you have sensible Euclidean correlators, then, then by analytic continuation, but you, if, if, you, if you have a field theory which has sensible Euclidean correlators, where I can say more about what sensible means in a second, then you, you also get a completely sensible Lorentzian theory by analytically continuing these correlators to the Lorentzian signature. And uh, what, what sensible, so let me just write it in, on the board, sensible Euclidean correlators implies sensible Lorentzian correlators where the later are obtained by analytic continuation of the former. Well, first, sensible means uh, that the Euclidean ones, uh, the, the Euclidean ones need, need, need to satisfy reflection positivity, which is just the Euclidean version of, of uh, unitarity, and must also be invariant under the isometric group. I think that's, that's all you need. Yeah, thank, thanks very much. Yeah, that's, that's somehow I thought of as an underlying assumption. Thanks, yeah. Uh, sensible on the, on the Lorentzian side means that the, empirically you have causality. That uh, the only that some of the, the only the only branch cuts correspond to to, the, to certain operators becoming light like separated. That, that's that's not obvious. From that it should be the case, but it, it is true in in uh, isometry invariant theories. I mean, I mean the correlation functions are are sensible in Euclidean signature. Uh, yeah, let me uh, maybe write it. So Euclidean correlators must be must be, uh, well, so let me say Poincaré invariant or the Euclidean version of Poincaré, which I guess is the isometric group. Poincaré invariant analytic and reflection positive. You can read more about reflection positivity, for example, in, in David Simons Duffin's notes from Tassi. There, there's, a, there's a nice discussion on that, reflection positive. Yes. Well, does it? Does it mean? Or, I mean, if you want to kind of continue, all this X is the complex uh, squared, so you need to specify the domain. 
No, I, I think I think it means it means complex analysis. Analyticity. Like the In the yeah, in, in, in some in some open set which in an open set which includes the the all the Euclidean configurations. Yeah, I, I didn't actually I didn't actually look at the theorem. So this this what I told you is basically all I know about the theorem, and the, I never never tried to study the proof. But the proof is is quite involved. It becomes it becomes simpler in, in a conformal setting, where I can claim to understand it better. So now let's look at the Lorentzian four-point function. So now we are in in Lorentzian space where we put put our operators. Yeah. So I I, I, sh I should say that in the in the remaindering remaining part of the talk. I'm not going to worry about, uh, I'm not going to have to worry about uh, issues like the ordering of the operators because I will always take my operators to be space-like separated. So even though they will be in Lorentz signature, they will always be space-like separated and therefore there is no, there is no ambiguity with, with the ordering because space-like separated operators commute with each other. So I will place the, again, operators x1, x3, x0, and 1 and x4 somewhere at infinity. And x2 is now going to be somewhere in the, in the, in the Lorentzian space, or in, the, in this two-dimensional subspace of it, which means that what happened to our coordinate z and z bar is that, well, now z becomes x1, well, which originally was x1, sorry, x1 plus i xd, now becomes x1 minus x0, and z bar became x1 plus x0. So now in Euclidean signature, they were complex and complex conjugates of each other, but in Lorentzian signature, they became real and independent of each other. You can, you can make, you can change z and z bar independently. What it means in this picture is that I can draw, draw the light cone. Oops, sorry. This is not optimal, but sorry about that. I can draw the light cone and uh, this direction is z bar and this direction is just is just z. In particular, this point corresponds to z z bar being 0, 0. This point is z z bar being 1, 1. This point would be 1, 0. And this point is 0, 1. But the, but the ni nice thing is that, that, that uh, not only that I can not only that I can think of the Euclidean configurations or the Lorentzian configurations, but actually, I'm, we are able to, to take z and z bar independent, uh, both complex and independent of each other. So this is this is, exact, this is exactly well. In, in a general quantum field theory, this is an as, this is an assumption that uh, that there is analogy in some open neighborhood of the of the Euclidean configuration, but in, a, in CFTs we can actually prove this, prove this rigorously. I'm going to explain it in a second. But we should be able to take z, z bar, both complex and independent of each other. And then the Euclidean and Lorentzian configuration are just some particular subsection of this double, of this C2, of this double complex space. No, I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't want to make, make, I don't want to make such, a, such a precise statement. I mean, in, in, a, 
in a moment, I'm going to describe what is the domain of analyticity in the in the Z and Z bar plane in a specific case. So I, I'm going to explain it in a specific case, and maybe we can we can talk later what it what it should be in general. But yeah, the, the point is that in a in a CFT in in unitary C, in unitary CFTs. Can actually, we can actually prove prove this analyticity, and uh, I, I refer you to to a paper of Tom Hartman, uh, Jane, and Kundu, which is which is uh, uh, with this archive number. It's called causality in in conformal field theory, and sections. Uh, Three and four contain a nice discussion of, of, this, of, this anal of these analyticity properties. I mean, the, the basic idea is that we. Okay, I no longer have the four-point function. Well, originally we def we 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 had the four-point function in Euclidean signature, expanded in conformal blocks. But but we have a good control over the conformal blocks. In particular, in the conformal blocks, we can we can take we can certainly take z and z bar to be independent complex because we just know what the functions are and it, it makes sense. Now now these expansions are positive and you can also go to a coordinate called a called a row coordinate where the expansion of the blocks themselves is positive. So by 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 knowing that uh, the the Euclidean OP is convergent. You can, actually, you can actually prove that you, you, can, you can find the, the correct region of analyticity. I mean, in, in other words, what, the, the function is going to be analytic whenever this complex exp, this, this expansion converges. It's a, it's a basic theorem in complex analysis. So you can, you can actually find exactly where, where this expansion converges for z and z bar being complex and independent of each other. And what is the up? What is the upshot of this? Well, in the specific case of the of the four point, four point function of four identical scalars, you find the following. So now I'm going to draw the z and z bar plane independently. Okay, this is. Z and this is Z bar. This is zero and one. Uh, remember, in Euclidean signature, the S channel, the S channel converged away from away from here. And in the, in this general complexified space, the the same is going to be true. So we are going to have an exponential convergence away away from this branch cut. And the same thing is also true in the in the Z bar variable. Now. Of, if, if you if you complexify both z and z bar, then the, the four-point function is not, is not single valued when when going around uh, after analytic continuation around around zero. So you should really think of think of the four-point function as living on some infinite sheeted cover of this space uh, where with, with a branch cut along this uh, along this axis. But even uh, if, if you only if you only go around zero, then the, the function is still I mean the, the OP is still converges, so the function is still analytic there. And, and, and similarly, well, and, and similarly, when we look at the, the t-channel expansion, then it, it will converge in a, in a region which is bounded away, away uh, both in the z, away from this this cut, both in the z and in the z bar variable. So now this, uh, okay. Now it is. Uh, I, 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 in, in, instead of instead of using the z and z bar variable, I, I prefer to go to a to another variable which maps this region without with the branch cuts to a, to the unit circle. So let me let me define it. There is a useful coordinate. Oh, it's, it's useful for some purposes. Coordinate w, which. In, in terms of which you can express z as follows, it's uh, w1, uh, w plus one squared divided by two times 
2 times w squared plus 1. And what it, what it does is that, well, it maps the, the region in the z variable without the branch cut to the, to the unit circle. So this is w and this is, this is z. So I can use some colors. So when I, in particular, the, the, the branch cut opens up and becomes uh, this semicircle. And similarly, this other branch cut opens up and becomes this semicircle. And uh, the, the crossing transformation, which is just z exchanged with 1 minus z, and at the same time, z bar exchanged with 1 minus z bar, becomes just w, w bar going into minus w minus w bar. So if I, if I now represent the, the, dub, the, the, region of con the, the region of convergence of the of the crossing equation becomes just uh, the direct product of two unit circles in the w and w bar variables. Okay. So th this is literally unit circle, so this would be point 0 in the in the w variable, but but just to make things more clear, I'm going to I'm going to denote the coordinates using the z variable. So this this point this point is the z equals 0. This point would be the z equal 1. The same thing here, z equals 0 z equal 1, this is the crossing symmetric point, z equal 1 half, sorry, z bar, z bar, z bar equals 1 half, and this is the point where z is, is i infinity, and this is the point where z is minus i infinity. So is, uh, are, these, are these pictures clear? No, is it? Right, so, so the, 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 whole, the whole point is, is to map the, the, the region where the, where, the where the crossing equation holds into the, inside a unit circle, because the unit circle is a, is a much nicer shape than the, the shape with the, with the two branch cuts taken away. Okay. Now, uh, the, let's, let's talk a little bit about what, what the different uh, Euclidean and Lorentzian configurations are. Well, we know that in a, in the Euclidean signature means that z and z bar are complex conjugates of each other, and because, th because the mapping between z and w preserves this reality property, all the Euclidean configurations correspond to the to points being complex, right, to, to a pair of points which is complex conjugates of each other. So one here and one here. So yeah, Euclidean configurations are precisely those pairs of w and w bar where the two, po the, where the two points are complex conjugates of each other. The, the, the Lorentzian configurations are precisely those where, where, both, where both W and W bar lie on this axis, so between, between 0 and 1 in the Z coordinate, and they are independent of each other. But, but the crossing equation in general holds, holds everywhere else in a, for, for W and W bar being independent and complex. And that, that's, that's some of, I think, an, an important fact about the, about the crossing equation, and it should be, it should be used in our in understanding of, of crossing using the bootstrap. Uh, so in, in particular, I would like to say a few words about, about various limits that one can take in this picture, because it includes all the, essentially all the limits that have in some, in some way been used in the, in the bootstrap nowadays. No, it's so in, 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 bo in both cases. So I, 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 can, I can analyze the situation in, in, a, in, in the z and in z bar independently of each other. So in, in, the, in the z variable, the crossing region is a, is a connected region. It's just the complex plane without the pair of branch cuts. And this, this connected region is mapped to the, to the unit circle. 
right? So this this point this point is mapped to the to the to the origin. Zero gets mapped to this point. One gets mapped to the to the other side, and i infinity gets mapped to this point. Minus i infinity gets mapped to this point. So in particular, the the line one half plus i t gets mapped to to this line. So what's outside the circle? Well, the the, the, the region outside of the circle in, in W is not a part of the this z complex plane, but but it can be reached by analytically continuing through the branch cut. If you if you start here and analytically and have some multivalid function, you can analytically continue through this branch cut to down, and that's going to take you outside of the unit circle here. Right. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Omega goes to one over. I, I, yeah. I guess. Yeah, but 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 but, but the, I mean the the proper way to the, the the specific point where you end up in this in this picture depends how exactly you how, how exactly you go outside of the, how exactly you pass through the branch cut. So if you if you pass through the branch cuts from the top, you're going to end up somewhere here. If you pass the branch cut from the bottom, you're going to end up somewhere here. Mm -hmm. So the, the nice thing about this picture is that it very nicely encapsulates all the various limits that have been used in the bootstrap. Let me let me draw the picture here again, just to. Mm -hmm. So first of all, we have the OPE limits, where we have the the S channel. The S channel OPE corresponds to ZZ bar going to zero zero. So that's that's the limit when when both in W. And W bar, we go. To, we approach this point. It, it doesn't matter in which direction. You can just approach it independently. But the behavior of the four-point function there is always controlled by the S-channel OPE. The T-channel OPE is when Z and Z bar approach one and one. So that just means independently, I can approach these two points in any way I want. Then U-channel. In this picture, would would be z z bar going to i infinity, but now I need to be careful and send it to minus i infi minus i infinity. So in this picture, that means that well, we, we in order to this sorry u channel u channel means that operator one approaches operator three. So in particular, z z bar goes to infinity, but we need to be careful in which way they go to infinity. And we, we the best way to is go to Euclidean signature where z and z bar are complex conjugates of each other. So we approach this point in the W coordinate and this point in the W bar coordinate. So those are the those are the OPE limits. Then another important kind of a limit that, that is going to be central in David's lectures is the so-called double light cone limit. The, the double light cone limit is when, when you go when you go again to the, to the Lorentzian space, it means that the operator two approaches both the light cone of operator one and the light cone of operator three. So we're going to take it all the way here. So it's sort of we are always approaching things from the space-like separated separated region, but we approach this point, which is z equal to zero, z bar equal to one. So in this picture, it just means that we take independently w to this point and w bar to this point. So let me, let me just say zz bar goes to either 0, 1 or 1, 0. They are, they are equivalent. It's either at the top or at the bottom. And there are also, other, there are also double light cone limits between the s and u channel and the t and u channel. So you can, you can easily check for yourself that when I go to 0 i inf plus or minus i infinity, this would be like the double light cone limit, I think, with the US of S and U operator. And uh, 1 and plus minus I infinity would be like the T and U double light cone limit. 
Okay, so, so in this way, we, we exhausted almost all the possible, well, some of all the possible limits that, that can be taken to the special points. So some of the, the points 0, 1, I infin minus infinity and I infinity are special because the four-point function has some singularities there, but, but uh, there, is, there is precisely one, one kind of limit which I haven't described, uh, which can be taken in this picture. Can, can anybody maybe, maybe tell me what have I missed? So I, I described when both go to the same point, like this. Does, these are the OPE limits, then there is the limit when one of them goes to zero, the other one goes to one, or one of them goes to zero to infinity, to plus infinity. There is the U channel OPE limit, which is one where I take, I take one operator to I infinity and the other one to minus I infinity, and there is there's exactly one, one which is left. It, it is the Rej limit, it is the Rej limit, but it, you're not going outside, but it is one where I go, in W I go to I infinity, and in W bar I also go to I infinity. Right? This is not the U channel OP limit, because in U channel I need to go to I infinity and minus I infinity, but, but this is a completely, completely new kind of limit, which is not controlled by any OP in any particular way. It can be approached from the inside of the crossing region. It's called the Regge limit. I won't have much, much more to say about it, but Joao in his lectures will, will talk at length about this limit. But I, th I think the, the important point which I want to make is that this, this limit can be reached from the inside of the crossing region and that's also why well, some, of it, some of it aspects can be seen from the be seen from the from bootstrap. The, I mean, the, usually the, the regular limit is, is presented in a slightly different way. It's where you, you I, I'm just gonna say this in words, but you, you start, you start inside a space-like separate region, then you take z-bar around the, the t-channel cut and you approach, you approach the s-channel singularity. Here we are doing something else. We are, let's, let's start, let's start in the, in, near the, near the u-channel OPE. So we start in the, near the region where w is here and w-bar is here. Now the, this is, so the, this, this region is controlled by the u-channel OPE. Um, and the U-channel OP stops converging as soon as I cross this line. So I can, I can take this point down, and as soon as I cross this line, it stops converging. This is, this is analogous to, to starting near the S-channel OP and going around the T-channel branch cut. So what, what, I, what I need to do here is that I start, say, with W over here, and I go up. As, as soon as I cross this line, the U-channel OP stops converging, and I approach the original, the original OP. So this, this, is, this, is exactly, this is exactly the same way that the regular limit works. So somehow my, my, point, my point of this whole discussion being is that all the, use, all the limits that have been used in the analytic bootstrap or even numerical bootstrap as we will soon see are, are just a part of the same picture where, where we, we work with operators in a space like separate regions and take various limits. But, and and, and yeah. finally the I already said it, but the, the, numer the numerical bootstrap limit is the one where you take W to this point and W bar to this point. So it's, it's in some sense the most democratic one. It can, it, it's, it's the same distance away from all the other special limits where analytic control is, is available. So as I say, in the, in, the, in the numerical bootstrap, we literally expand the equation around these two points, and then we, we, we perform some analysis, which I'm going to describe later, later in these lectures. But if you go to a sufficiently high order in, this, in these expansions, you can, you can start seeing the, the physics of the various limits, because I, mean, the, I can, I can ex expand the value of the four-point function at any, at any point with arbitrary complex pair of coordinates in terms of the Taylor expansion around here because the function is, is doubly analytic in the two things. So in this, in this way, the numerical bootstrap manifestly also sees the, what, what is going around the, around the expansion regions of the, of the, of the analytic double icon or even the regge bootstrap. 
if you, if you, if you don't understand all, all these words, don't, don't worry because you're going to learn, learn all about it in the, in the following weeks in, from, from David's and Joao's lectures, respectively about the double eight cone bootstrap and the ratchet bootstrap. Okay, are there any questions about this so far? Is it because everybody is lost or because it's, it's, it's too trivial? I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, yeah, I'm just bad at writing. It's W. Are you claiming that you could actually get the radio level without ever using that circle? Yes. That's right. It's, 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 just, it's just a different way of taking the regular limit. You usually, usually to take the regular limit, you start, I mean, usually you do, you do this. You, you, you do the regular limit of the S channel, right? You start here, then you, uh, you only continue like that, and then approach back. But, that but. Right, right, that, that's right. It, it would, well, it, it, would, it would take you, because there is a branch cut starting here, it would take you to a different sheet. But, but if you project down to the W bar, you go around this branch cut and come back and, and do the OP like that, with W bar and W approaching this point. But what I said before is completely equivalent. You st we, we do not start in, we start on the physical, sh we, we start say near the, near the U-channel OPE, which is in this complex conjugate set of points. Then going around this branch cut is equivalent to passing through the real line. Because th this is where the U-channel OP doesn't converge, and going up to this point. You, 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 can, you can actually, it's a useful exercise to just check it with manipulation, to just ask yourself, what is the, what is the analytic behavior of the, of the four-point function in this region? And you're, you can use transformation properties of the conformal blocks to see it's, it's just the regular limit. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. So I already mentioned the numerical bootstrap. I'm not sure if I'm going to have time to, to finish this discussion in this, in this lecture, but let me, let me start anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so let me, let me say a few words about uh, a geometric picture for the crossing equation. Um, yeah, it's, it's going to be useful to, to, to write the crossing equation as follows. So we just, we just bring the, both the S and T channel contribution to the same side of the equation and define a function F. So this F is just the anti-symmetrized combination. So this, this, is, this is now the way that we write the crossing equation. And uh, the, the, the way to think about it is that it, well, it's, it's, a, it's an equation parameterized by z and z bar, which, which constrains the spectrum. It, con it constrains the possible deltas, j's, and, and the c phi phi o's, which can, which can appear. And uh, because, because all the operators enter linearly into the equation, it's, it, it, is, it is good to think about the, the vector space in which, in, which equ in which this equation lives. So it's really, it really lives in some, in some vector space of functions of two complex variables. So it's essentially, it is the vector space of all complex functions of w, w and w bar living in, the, living in this double disk, where I also should say something about the singularities at, the, at various points, but I, I, won't have, I won't have much time to, to talk about it. But um, so let, let's, let's think about the vector space of uh, complex analytic functions. Mm -hmm. 
in Z and Z bar. Of course, the one problem is that this is an infinite dimensional vector space. But we can, we can start thinking more geometrically by, by projecting down to some specific finite dimensional subspace of this vector space. One specific projection to a finite dimensional subspace of this infinite dimensional vector space is achieved in the, in the numerical bootstrap, where one simply, well, in the numerical bootstrap, one uses the, the projection, well, projection, which consists of, uh, of computing derivatives in Z and Z bar of some orders well, a, where A plus B should be odd because the equation is, is odd under, under the, well, sorry, derivatives evaluated at Z and Z bar being equal to one half, so precisely at the at the center of these two circles, literally the Taylor expansion coefficients of the, of the test function around the, the, around the most symmetric point. And after you truncate to A plus B being bounded by, by some number, capital N, you can, you can represent this special case of the bootstrap equation in, in some finite dimensional vector space. So let's see how this works. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, so it's it's because when I when I apply this this functional when I when I it's essentially because the the set of functions in which this equation lives is odd under z goes to one minus z. So all the, all the Taylor expansion coefficients, uh, when the sum of the two derivative orders is even, actually vanish. Right? So the, the, the only ones which are non-trivial are the ones where the sum, is, sum of A and B is odd. Mm -hmm. So let's, uh, let's project down for, for simplicity. Let's project down to a two-dimensional, uh, to 2D. This would correspond to for example, choosing uh, well, A and B, we can choose to be one zero, and the next one would be two one, because the, the well, in in a case in a case when the formal is, is parity symmetric, there is actually a symmetry which exchanges A B with B A, so I should only consider symmetrized uh, ordered, uh, I should only consider unordered pairs, so the, the first two ones would correspond to A. A, B being one, zero, or, or two, one. And then I can, I can represent the, the vectors. So instead of functions of two coordinates, they become two component vectors. All right, so I replace Z, Z bar with these two, two components. So all the, all the vectors entering the equation be, will become two-dimensional vectors. And I can draw them on the two-dimensional plane spanned by those two, deriv those two derivatives. Maybe they look like this. So, so in, uh, now in, in, this, in this way, it becomes much more clear to see why I can, why I can impose some, some constraints on the allowed spectrum. So let's, let's, let's assume that, that uh, l let's, let's assume that all the operators which appear in that, in that OPE lie in some specific set. So we have some set of these delta i's and j i's. It, it can be a finite set, it can be a continuous set, doesn't, doesn't really matter. And let's, let's, plot, let's plot all of these uh, vectors in a two-dimensional plane. And, and now we are asking, for what kinds of sets is it possible to satisfy that equation? Well, 
Re remember that, that, c, that c squared must be positive. So I'm, I'm literally asking in which case is it possible to sum up all these vectors with, uh, with positive coefficients so that they add up to zero. Well, in, in this case, it's, it's clearly possible because the, because the center, I, mean, I, can, I, can cer I can certainly pick, say, this vector, this vector, and this vector, and add, add them up with positive coefficients to zero. And the, the reason is that the, the origin lies in the, in the convex hull of those, of those vectors. So th this, is, this is indeed the general, the general rule that, well, let me, let, let's draw a situation where it's impossible. Clear, well, clearly when I, when I draw three such vectors, when, when, if, if this was the, if, if these three vectors would, would be the, the set S, then clearly I, I cannot add them up with positive coefficients to, to zero because every positive linear combination is going to lie strictly above this horizontal line, right? So th this, this, is, this is precisely the rule that <coughs> it's that the crossing equation is impossible to satisfy if and only if there exists some line through the origin with all the f of i's on one side. Is this, is this clear? Uh -huh. You have a question? Yeah, yeah, so the, the, the two components of fi's are, well, okay, this, the f1 would be the, the first z derivative evaluated at one half, and the zero z bar derivative evaluated at one half of this, of this function f z z bar. And uh, the second component would be the second derivative with respect to z, and first derivative with respect to z bar. Okay, so, so for, every, for every delta and j, I get two numbers, which are these two derivatives, and those are the two components, the, these are the, the two components of the vectors. Okay? I can use any, any two, sorry, maybe I, I didn't make this, this clear enough. I can, I can use any projection of this infinite dimensional vector space that I want. I'm, I'm actually make, make it slightly more, I'm gonna make it slightly more precise now, but you could, you can take, I mean, it, it, eventually, eventually we would somehow like to explore the, the whole infinite dimensional vector space, of course. So in, in the end, you, you, would want to, you would want to look at the Taylor expansion coefficients of arbitrary order, and indeed this is, this is what happens in numerical bootstrap, that. Uh, you, you, can, you cannot go strictly to the infinite dimension, but, but we, can, we can make the, the problem bigger and bigger by including more and more Taylor expansion coefficients. So let's, let's formalize this a little bit. The, 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 the right formalization is, stems from the fact that you should, you should really think of this, of this line that, that forbid this kind of spectrum as a, as a linear functional acting on, the, acting on this two-dimensional vector space. So this, this corresponds to some linear operator acting on the vectors such that it's, the linear functional is positive here and negative here and zero and zero here. So. Let's formalize a little bit. So let's, let's define an omega, which will be called a bootstrap functional. It's, it's some object which, well, it's a, it's a linear operator or linear functional. acting on, on this vector space V, the vector space of functions of two, of two coordinates, such that it's, it first of all satisfies that when I act with, with omega on, uh, 
on the bootstrap vectors, then I get some I get some real number. So in particular, the result is is finite, and I, I should get a real number for all delta and j, which are allowed in principle by unitarity bounds. And, and second of all, this, this condition is a, is a little bit technical, and it, it stems from the fact that in the crossing equation, we, well, in the in the crossing equation, we are always summing over infinitely many operators. So it is not immediately clear that that something which is linear can can act linearly on infinite linear combinations of operators. So let let me just let me just write it. This the condition that stems from this fact. So for every crossing, we, we should require that omega is only consistent if for every crossing symmetric spectrum, so spectrum which leads to a crossing symmetric four-point function, we can, we can drop the tails. In particular, the limit, as delta star goes to infinity, of, well, we can act with omega on the, sorry, so I should. So we are looking at the at the limit, yeah. and the limit of the action of, the, of this of this linear functional on the tail of the OP expansion. So we are summing all the operators which are above some delta star. So in order for us to be able to drop the tail, this, this should go to zero, and, uh, and the same for the t-channel. Now, if, if, these conditions, if these conditions are satisfied, I can just take omega and apply it to the original crossing equation. So I take omega, apply it to, to that equation in a box up on the middle blackboard at the top, and I conclude that that the equation holds with, with uh, f being replaced by the action of omega on f. So in the, in the specific example above, uh, we were using two functionals. One was one was this. Well, one was this one, and evaluated at one half, one half, and the other one was this one, evaluated one half, one half, and and uh, and both of these satisfy both of these conditions. The, the second condition is satisfied essentially because the convergence of the OP is, is exponentially fast. So, so the tail, the tails uh, around uh, around the crossing symmetric point, is exponentially suppressed as delta star goes to infinity, and imp also its derivative is exponentially suppressed. So, that condition is fine. But in the in the exercise today, you're going to see see an example of uh, of functionals of, of, of which 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 are not consistent in this in this sense. So, so, so for which this this additional condition of being able to drop the tail. Is actually important. Um. So this is probably necessary, but not a sufficient condition. What you really want is for that sum to converge. Well, the, 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 the convergence, the convergence of this sum is a, is a consequence of being able to drop the tail. That, that's, a, that's a pretty nice exercise. You can you can show it that if if it because omega is linear. Right, well, I can maybe. I can quickly say, it, but well, if omega is linear, I have some finitely many terms, which I can always, which I, where I can use linearity, and then I have some tail. So. But it should go to it should go to zero sufficiently quickly, sufficiently fast, so that the sum converges. Literally, the only the these are the necessary and sufficient conditions for for everything to work. If if these two, well, certainly they are they are necessary for that equation to 
for, for you being able to derive that equation from that equation, and they are also sufficient for this, this sum to converge. That you, 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 can, you can try to show how a linearity and uh, the being able to, and vanishing of the tails implies that this sum is convergent. It's, it's just a relatively easy exercise. Well, I guess, I guess I'm, I'm out of time, so um, I, I'm going to, going to continue tomorrow to, to tell you more about extremal functionals and, and uh, both examples of numerical and analytic functionals, so thanks, thanks very much.